Hey there, everyone. It is Denise Salcedo. Welcome back to the channel. I am very happy, very stoked because today my guest is none other than Rocky Romero. What's up, Rocky? What's up, Denise? It's good to uh, good to see you. Yeah, you know, I got to tell you, you're legitimately one of my favorite people in wrestling because I feel like you just have this very, very good energy. So anytime I see you at events, whether we bump into each other a bunch of times or whether we do these interviews, this is now, I believe, like the third interview mm -hmm. that you and I have done together throughout the years. Fourth, actually, that we've done wow. together throughout the years. So I always love having you on. Yeah, it's always good seeing you. And like you said, like when we're at the shows or whatever, I was like, oh, Denise, hey, you know, give, give you a big hug but uh, it was yeah so thanks funny. yeah they, thanks for having me again on here uh, I always love uh chatting it up with you you always you always ask the best questions and it's always a great interview so nice nice okay so let's go ahead and dive right into it because there's so much that I want to ask you uh surrounding you know one of the biggest uh shows that we've had in quite some time especially given how newsworthy it was given that it was a co you know a joint show between AEW and New Japan Pro Wrestling a big weekend uh I, I'm gonna start off by asking you now that you know the weekend is done the show has been completed you're good to go uh Rocky how are you feeling after everything feeling like i need a little bit of a break <laughs> that's a, <laughs> that's honestly how i felt but yesterday i i you know i was hanging out and i just relaxed i didn't do anything i played video games for the first time in like months i ate so many cookies i uh <laughs> I was e eating very badly and just not caring. Didn't even think about working out or anything like that. I, it's just complete, like, just vacation mode for at least a couple of days. Uh, you know, just with that huge weight off my shoulders with Forbidden Door. But also, like, celebrating, you know, because obviously, you know, it was a, a huge success uh, in so many ways financially. And uh, it was such a big success with the, with the fan base as well. And, and uh, AEW fans, New Japan fans, pro wrestling fans in general. So, and the feedback has been awesome, you know, for a show that had so many issues going into it and so many problems uh, every day, sometimes, you know, there seemed to be a new problem, you know, going back and forth between Tony and Gato and going to one of them and saying, hey, so this happened and, uh, you know, so what should we do, <laughs> you know, like, or, you know, whatever it may be, uh, you know, finally just to, to, for it to be in the books and for it to be a success. Uh, it just feels really, really good. So let's go ahead and get into all of the juicy details and everything that involved getting Forbidden Door off and running. So I want to start off by uh, asking you, because in the media call, Tony Khan put you over tremendously. And then again, in the uh, press conference that followed the show, he made sure to give you a round of applause along with everybody in the room. And so it was, I think, a really uh, nice moment. And one of the things that he said was that you were sort of the person uh, in between him and uh, Ghetto, who were you guys were doing... You you were like the mediator between both Tony and Ghetto. So I want to start off by uh, asking you uh, if you can give us like a rundown of what your responsibilities, what your duties entailed surrounding Forbidden Door and how you essentially helped, uh, you know, pull this event together. Um, so, yeah, I mean, since day one, kind of, you know, since the New Japan AEW relationship was kind of on ice, you know, when, once, you know, the elite guys kind of had had exited New Japan and there was kind of a worry of like how things are going to go forward and how are they going to move forward. And our president at the time kind of didn't really see the potential in maybe working with AEW. You know, we already had had partners in ROH and CMLL. So, you know, like maybe they were thinking like, well, you know, let's see how this AEW thing turns out before jumping into it, you know, so we don't offend our partners. And, you know, obviously those guys had left ROH too. So like, it was, it was a very messy, complicated situation. Uh, so now, you know, jumping forward to, you know, I would say what, about a year and a half ago uh, when Kenny called me and, uh, and had, you know, pitched the idea of, of, you know, kind of opening the doors a little bit. Obviously Moxie was still kind of working with New Japan and Jericho was as well. But, um, but you know, the Kenny and the Bucks were obviously a pivotal, important part of New Japan prior to AEW. And so, you know, with that and their EVPs, so, you know, they hold quite a bit of power. So uh, not wanting to, to, you know, just forget about them completely, we had to kind of like open the relationship and, and Kenny kind of opened that, you know, and 
and said, hey, you know, I, I, I have this idea of working, you know, Kenta coming into AEW and working with Moxie since they already had a storyline. And that's kind of where everything started. And, uh, you know, going forward, I've kind of always been like in between AEW and New Japan uh, since that day. And uh, so it just continued on when we started talking about this, you know, this Forbidden Door show and what it could be and possibly be. Then I just went back and forth between AEW and New Japan and, and, and tried to be uh, sensible and then try to be the one that to kind of communicate how everybody, you know, what the ideas were, but also like sentiment and just kind of like what, uh, you know, overall what, what the show needed, whether it be like, Hey, we need more of this or we need more of this, or Hey, let's not forget about like American fans like this, or, you know, Japanese fans, we, we need to cater to them this way, you know, kind of like really trying to break that down so that both sides could understand two completely different ways of doing business. You know, like AEW model is obviously a, a traditional American TV model where Japanese, uh, New Japan is more of a, a very Japanese uh, tour-based model. So it's very different the way that they, they, they kind of book shows and, and do things. So I kind of had to like explain that on both sides. Yeah. Long story so, short. <laughs> I, I like that. No, I think these details are incredible. Now, I do want to ask because, you know, you kind of talked a little bit about, you know, how Kenny Omega kind of, you know, helped with that relationship out between AEW and New Japan Pro Wrestling. So when the announcement was made, uh, when Tony Khan basically said like, hey, this this joint show, it's happening. And everybody was like, oh, you know, this is really happening because for a bit it was just a rumor. And so when it was finally confirmed, I, I think my question to you is, was this an event that uh, you think that AEW – like, who was the first to initiate the idea or the concept of doing this joint show? Was it more uh, AEW Tony Khan? Was it Kenny Omega? Was it New Japan? Like, how did this actually come about? And how did both sides say, like, hey, yes, like, this is more than idea, like, more than an idea now. Let's actually start putting uh, the pieces into place for it to actually happen. I think, now, nobody get mad at me if I, my memory doesn't serve me well. But I think that I sent a text to Tony and said, I think it would be cool if there was somehow we could figure out how to do some kind of joint event. And then it just kind of started from there. And then I think he immediately had like ideas about what they could do, you know, what we could do card wise. And, um, you know, starting with like, honestly, starting with Okada, Jay, Hangman, I'm not sure if Cole was in the picture at that time or not, or if Cole maybe came later, but that, that was kind of already an idea. So it was funny that it all kind of worked out that way, uh, you know, all the way to Forbidden Door, which this probably conversation was like 10 months ago or so, I would say, you know, so, so quite a ways away, you know? And uh, so, yeah, I, I, I think that's kind of how it started. And then it kind of like snowballed and obviously both sides get busy in what they're actually doing because, like, you know, like Tony said, I think in the press or something that, you know, New Japan is running a full-time promotion. AEW is running a full-time promotion. So it's very difficult to get everybody, you know, together to, to make, you know, three weeks before to do a show, you know. So it, it's very difficult because scheduling is uh, a nightmare, you know. So, uh, so yeah, that's kind of where it started. I, I want to say like 10 months ago, and I think it started with that text, yeah. And it's interesting, too, because I'm assuming you're like, you know, you shoot off an idea, but you know, how many times don't people shoot off ideas and you don't ever really know if it's going to be, you know, executed, if both sides mm -hmm. are going to agree to it, you know, just all right. the parties involved, if they're going to go for it. So what was your reaction to like, hey, this is happening and here this is going to be your role in this. And uh, how did you feel like heading into it? Uh, stress. <laughs> A whole lot of stress. No, I mean, uh, obviously, like knowing that you know, I always felt obviously, and I, I think, you know, for the most part, Tony and, and New Japan felt that like it was going to be, a, you know, this thing was going to be a success, you know, but, uh, you know, no matter what. And obviously it, it kind of showed that the way, in the way that, you know, ticket sales went, you know, in the pre-sale, you know, basically sold out the United Center. So, um, but uh, just kind of like getting there was stressful, you know, first it started out with, you know, kind of the basic terms of what the deal was going to be on both sides. And, it, you know, both sides are happy. Luckily th the initial part of the negotiation was pretty fairly easy. And then, you know, just working out details from there, uh, both sides were, were pretty giving on, on, on each side to, because they wanted to make it work. You know, obviously there's a huge potential for, uh, for business, you know, 
So, uh, so that, that part, once we got part, you know, done with that part, then it was like, okay, now we move on to creative. And then that where that's where it got like difficult. Like I said, due to scheduling other things, injuries, everything else that came down the pipeline, uh, you know, people getting fevers at the last second, you know? So, um, so yeah, so that, and then it got even more and more difficult. And then finally the last 24 hours or so, it, you know, Hiroma got, you know, got a fever, couldn't come, couldn't make the plane ride. And then it was like, this is crazy. Like everybody's saying the show is cursed. And I started to feel like this show is cursed. This show is cursed. Something bad is going to happen. And then it goes off without a hitch the day of. And, you know, it obviously like now, you know, people are, it, it felt really good for an event that had, I feel like a lot of mixed emotions and everybody had seemed to have an opinion on the show. And a lot of people were saying, oh, this thing will never do, do well in America. Da, 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 da. Then the, the sellout happened. Um, obviously, uh, pay-per-view numbers so far have, you know, have been really, really good, you know, very, very good. And, uh, and, um, and yeah, I mean, like 15,000 plus people showed up to the United Center that night. So like, not a, not a bad night, you know, in the first show that, that supposedly was cursed and wouldn't do good business, you know? So, uh, you know, thanks for all the, you know, thanks to all the haters for hating on it. <laughs> Cause I think honestly, I think it was, um, it honestly also helped promote the show you know that that's the funny thing about everything is like everybody kind of having an opinion on the show and how saying how it wouldn't work got people talking about it and you know whether what you know whether what side you were on it uh it, it helped to kind of drive uh this interesting narrative that you know that this curse show wasn't going to be successful so uh you know thank you to everybody because that's controversy creates cash right didn't we learn that from eric bishop we did actually learn that. And that's the thing, too, because I remember when the the show was first announced and it was like, OK, like that seems like a good idea for both, uh, you know, AEW and New Japan Pro Wrestling. And I did see people on social media that just didn't understand why this was going to be a thing. And I was like, I feel like history has shown itself uh, that, you know, joint shows, they draw interest. And for the most part, they do very well. So I was surprised when there were some people that were like, oh, this show isn't going to do well, blah, blah, blah. But I do think that one of the, uh, you know, uh, we did find out the card kind of late, right? But mm -hmm. here's the thing, though. I remember when all of the, you know, CM Punk being out, Brian Danielson being out, and then again, the curse show topic. Uh, it, it got to the point where I started thinking it. I was like, maybe this show's curse and then the next day everybody was like putting it out there and then we got some more news breaking about yeah. the show and i started thinking oh my god like this is just like this is nuts right uh so you know obviously as you know somebody that's helping put the show together you guys had this initial vision and i know tony khan kind of mentioned this in the media call that you know they had you guys had uh you know different plans for the actual card and then it wasn't until i believe he said like two weeks or so prior that he didn't even know for sure if he was going to have okada on the show or jay white so how did you guys you know work around not only the injuries but the travel restrictions uh and creative and also for you uh, making sure that, you know, since you're that person in the middle, making sure that both AEW and New Japan are, you know, are happy and that they're satisfied. Well, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, uh, you know, uh, I don't know. I mean, it just kind of like everything happened so fast, you know, it was constantly like just pivoting, right? And, and having, you know, luckily, I mean, we can start at the top, you know, losing Punk was a big deal, obviously, you know, you know, here comes, you know, Hiroshi Tanahashi, we do this big angle in, in Los Angeles where he comes out, they do the face off. And, uh, you know, Tony had all these great ideas to put FTR with with Punk and, uh, you know, and Tana, yeah. oh, some really, really great ideas that didn't end up happening the way that they actually happened. They, they got different versions of it, but like, thank God the, the, the one, thing that was always in the background was always Tanahashi Moxley. They've had, you know, this is like a two year plus storyline. Uh, you know, if you remember back, I think you were at the LA show resurgence for new Japan where, you know, uh, Ta you know, Tana was being stalked by Moxley and he came out during, you know, the, the match where Tana, it was Tana and, uh, and Lance Archer for the, the U S belt. And, uh, so like, thank God that was always kind of like, up our sleeve, you know, you know, and, and so it just felt like that was the right way to go because the storyline was already there. It is a dream match. Who's, you know, two great people who represent each company in Tana and Moxley, 
and uh, it just seemed like it made, you know, it, it made sense, you know? So, uh, so thank God we, th there was that, you know, with already a built in storyline where you didn't have to really like look too far out for it. Um, and then, uh, and then, yeah. And then, you know, obviously losing Danielson because, you know, he was going to be a big part of it. You know, ZSJ had put out the challenge to, to Danielson and everybody was really excited about that, but then lose that as well. But thank God, Tony had a nice in his, in the hole where he, you know, I didn't even know that, you know, this, that he had Cesaro basically ready to, ready to go. So, uh, so once Cesaro stepped in, I was like, oh, well, this is, you know, obviously this is going to be huge. Cesaro's first time out of WWE in many, many years. And here he's going to wrestle Zach Tim Jr. Who's also, you know, one of the top wrestlers in the world. So, just, you know, and, and it's a built-in storyline and it helps AEW because they've got, you know, the the Danielson storyline going you know along with Jericho and Moxley and all these guys going into blood and guts so it kind of all worked out thank God you know like that's what I'm saying like even if all these things happened it always seemed like there was an, a a good pivot like both both what's cool too is like both rosters are so deep that you could definitely easily pivot into something else so you're not just depending on one roster you're depending on two which is nice you know so if, uh. I definitely think uh, going forward, probably you know, into Forbidden Door 2, when and if that happens, uh, I think it'll be a much smoother uh, working relationship. Like everything is, should be much smoother because now I think both companies have a true understanding of like how each one works, what, you know, the things that we can do better, obviously going into the Forbidden Door 2 and, um, and, you know, what, you know, fix all the, the problems minus injuries and things that you can't really uh, you, you you know they just kind of happen you know unfortunately that's just the name of the game yeah it's just those are things that are completely out of your control and all of that like you mentioned because you guys did have the plans and unfortunately you know this is not an easy business injuries are a thing so I do want to ask you since you mentioned Forbidden Door 2 and I know Tony has mentioned that that's something that he definitely would be interested in so this is kind of a two-part question mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned uh, things that you guys would do differently so I do want to ask what are some of those things and then the other portion of that is you guys already know now that this joint show is successful in the United States given given the ticket sales, et cetera. So with that being said, do you think that there's a possibility of Forbidden Door 2 being held in Japan? So I know that that's something that New Japan is very interested in doing. And, and it doesn't necessarily have to be Forbidden Door 2. I mean, it could be, you know, Forbidden Door 3 or something, you know, could definitely be in Japan. Um, but I, I, you said that, you know, it being successful in the United States, yes, but also... Forbidden Door was successful internationally. So I feel like that's uh, something that could be left open. There's, you know, definitely tons of places that you could go internationally with, with a card like Forbidden Door. Um, but yeah, I would like to see that in the... Sorry, All right, we're good. Another, we're good. We're good. We're good. You're so a I, busy man. You're a busy man. <laughs> <laughs> just getting so many phone calls. Out of it. So, no, um, it's okay. So uh, yeah, I, I think Forbidden Door uh, would be successful internationally, no matter, you know, I obviously the US would be great. It would be cool to see it in Chicago. It'd be cool to see it in New York. It would be cool to see it in Tokyo. Um, you know, I, it just depends on the timing, I think, of if, just, if we decide to do it you know, June of next year, or if it needs to be, you know, accompanied a part of, you know, January 4th and 5th or something, you know, I mean, I think there's a lot of options. So, um, uh, yeah, I mean, and, and things that we would do differently. Um, I feel like scheduling will be a lot easier because we'll know kind of X amount of weeks out, you know, if people need to come to America. Some of the things that we do differently, I think would be, uh, scheduling would probably be a much smoother, knowing that we probably need about, you know, three to four weeks out for some talent to travel back and forth, whether it be in the U.S. or Japan. And that was some of the things, too, is like uh, the Japan side would have loved to have AEW people come over to Japan to help make storylines. But the problem, obviously, being that there wasn't enough uh, time to get visas and other things that, that just were beyond our control because visas literally opened up like three weeks before uh, you know, the, sh the ever the build to Forbidden Door started. So almost impossible to really get visas at the, at the last second. Um, so kind of now knowing how, what we need to do, I think we could definitely fix it where I think it's going to be an even more exciting build uh, 
uh, to build in the pay per view, which which will be cool. You know, you know, imagine Brian Danison shows up at Dominion or something like that, or you know, imagine you know CM Punk shows up or you know, or Kenny or somebody. You know, that'd be really really cool. So. I think that's so cool just to, you know, really, there's just so many possibilities that can be done on both ends of the spectrum. So that's really awesome. So Rocky, I do want to ask you as well, because, um, and I don't know, and you can kind of correct me on this. Is this the first time you really got to work this closely um, with Tony Khan? And if so, what was that experience like? Well, I've been working with Tony a lot, you know, ever since the relationship opened up, ever, you know, starting with that, you know, the Kenny Omega Kenta versus was it, or uh, no was was it uh, Moxley and no oh, yeah Moxley and Archer against Kenta and and uh, and Kenny so that that's kind of where it started and really um, communicating with Tony and all the th- all the things that you've seen that you know people showing up on on AEW television and and AEW stars coming to New Japan Strong uh, that you know that's all been you know Tony and I going back and forth so. Uh, you know, definitely built a really solid relationship between New Japan and AEW where I, I know Tony has said this, where like now I can, you know, truly say that both companies have, have trust in each other and, and, uh, and confidence in the relationship. So uh, that's, that's really been the, the, the most important thing in all this is, is building that. And, uh, and both companies, I think, have the same view of like, let's do something cool for the fans and, and really trying to, you know, do something different because no matter what, there's always a, a, another company who has such a, a strong hold on the professional wrestling business worldwide that uh, teaming up only makes sense because, you know, we have these t- totally awesome products that, you know, they don't need to, you know, one is in Japan, one is in America, you know, so like, we can totally team up and not hurt each other's uh, business or, or revenue share or anything like that, where it just mis- seems to make sense to come together and, and really put on something for the fans. Exactly. Completely agree. You know, like I said, it benefits both sides in, you know, different ways, but it just, you know, adds to it. Uh, you know, the more possibilities, the more there is with wrestling and all of that. So uh, let's go ahead and jump into the actual card itself. I want to start off with your match because mm-hmm. I have a couple of questions regarding that. Uh, how did you feel being able to take part in this marquee matchup, uh, you know, for the winner take all uh, the, th- the, th- the three way tag team? Like, what was that opportunity like for you? And did you ever think that? you and Trent would be, you know, be here once again. I never thought that me and Trent would be here once again. That's for sure. <laughs> Just like I thought, you know, you know, our storyline kind of ended a couple years ago. And then obviously Trent moved on to AEW and, you know, I stayed with New Japan and, and started to do my own thing there. So um, obviously, like, it's cool that Tony was really such a big fan of kind of like the Bucks and Rapungi Vice. And, you know, that was like, you know, pre AEW and kind of, I mean, it, obviously that stuff is so important to how they built AEW as well. So it's like kind of just goes full circle. So to have a uh, Rapungi Vice team, and then you kind of have this unique, you know, thing of like, you have FTR, which is an AEW team. You have the United Empire, which is a new Japan team. And then you have Rapungi Vice, which is one and one, you know, you know, one New Japan guy, one AEW guy. So it's it's kind of cool. Uh, and it's definitely like very forbidden door. It feels like it's it's right on the nose with it. So like, I think it made sense. And obviously now that FTR holds the IWGP heavyweight tag, t- tag team championships and the ROH tag team champions. So like it kind of opens up so many more possibilities, you know, for FTR to maybe travel to Japan or maybe, you know, do New Japan strong or, you know, something I think that, you know, there's obviously something there. So uh, that's really exciting because they're an awesome team. And to have FTR and New Japan, that's more dream matches that the fans are going to get. So I think it's really cool. And speaking of FTR, I got to ask, what was it like being in the ring with them? Good. Those guys hit hard. <laughs> they hit real hard. But, uh, but I like it. You know, that's, that's the, the kind of wrestling I like. So to be, to work, to be working with those guys, it's, it's, it's really cool. Um, obviously they have such a different way of how they look at tag team wrestling than like I do tag team wrestling. So, uh, it, it's, it's, it makes for a good combination, I think. And, and not only that, when we had the, um, the tag match with them for the ROH tag team titles in Vegas, uh, that was an awesome match. I really enjoyed that match. And, you know, so if, if we get a chance to do Rapunia Vice versus FTR in the future, 
Uh, I hope we get like 20 minutes and we can do it. So, you know, something really cool. Maybe we'll do it in New Japan. You know, that can, that can be awesome. See if Trent wants to come back at some point. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. I think that would be so awesome for the fans and just everybody involved. Uh, so Rocky, you know, we had so many matches that took place that night. Uh, you know, from your perspective, what matches do you think that you're like, man, I just thought those were so great. Uh, any specific moments that you really loved? Uh, anything of the show that you would say really stood out to you or was your favorite part? So I thought, okay, a couple of matches. Well, for sure, I think the match of the night stole the show was is easily Orange Cassidy versus Will Ospreay. Um, the funny thing is, is like here's another example of of the fans being like, oh, you could have done anything with Will. He could be wrestling, blah da 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 da. But it's like, and that this was uh, Tony's idea was was Cassidy and Osprey, and um, I I saw the potential in it because I was like, oh, that's so money because that's a dream match that maybe you wouldn't think of right off the bat, but it's a for sure dream match because there's so many layers to it. Not only you're going to see great wrestling because everybody kind of forgets sometimes that Cassidy is such a great wrestler because he has such a fantastic gimmick. So um, in character, so then, you know, you get two great wrestlers, you get heel Osprey, who's an a-hole. And then you get like orange Cassidy who, you know, if, if you don't love orange Cassidy, I mean, you don't have a pulse, I feel like, you know, like, so, so, um, so, you know, you get all those layers on top of it and, and, you know, it's a party, you know, like that match feels like a party, you know, that's like what professional wrestling, I, I, I think in this generation really, really loves, you know, kind of something like built off of like a PWG show, but in front of, you know, 20,000 people or whatever, you know? So, um, so yeah, I thought, I thought that that was gonna, you know, kick butt and, it exceeded my expectations because it, it really stole the show. But the funny thing is like, even going into it, um, OC was like, I'm not sure, you know, like he was a little like tentative, like maybe, maybe that's not a, a great matchup for me. I was like, dude, this is going to be awesome. You know? So like, I, it's cool to see it. And then we, we actually talked about it after and he was like, dude, that match, that was one of my favorite matches of all time, like I've ever done. I was like, he was like, dude, I, don't, I can't believe I was tentative. I was like, if you're not tentative and, and you care about what you do, I mean, like, you, you're not, then you really don't care, you know? So like, you, you got to feel that way, I think, as a performer and always kind of questioning what you're going to do. But uh, I think every, you know, I think for the most part, like Tony and I knew that it was going to be a home run for sure. Um, Completely agree. Yeah. And then, uh, and then another great match that I, I thought was really cool was just going to be like Sting and Darby and LIJ against the Bullet Club. Just because I knew that, you know, I've, I've never seen Sting or the Young Bucks ever interact. And then you throw Darby in there, who, you know, who's really, really fantastic. Then you put LIJ, you put this weird combo together versus, you know, Bullet Club. And like, it, there's no way that that's going to be bad. And, and it was really, really awesome. And, um, yeah, I think at first everybody was like, do we want to do that match? I was like, no, this is a great match. This is, this is a and really, And then the really way Sting match. came in, too. Yeah, that was ex freaking exactly, crazy. Exactly. I don't know how Sting does it. He's just jumping off everything. like, And he's like, I don't know how old <laughs> he's up there, yeah. though. And he's just like crazier than ever. Like, I don't know. I hope, I, I, I hope I'm like that when I like get into my, into my, my older years. Just jump, like just become a hardcore legend, you know, 50 yeah. something. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, no, super, what a, what a great uh, example of another great example of forbidden door, right? Like forbidden door should be kind of like crazy matches kind of put together. I think, you know, like obviously there's going to be some matches that make sense and have storylines, but sometimes they, I think they can just be like, Hey, let's get this, this person and put them with this person. And like, really just mix it up, you know, completely and let it be completely fresh. And that was just such a fresh matchup, uh, you know, for the fans. And, and it really worked out great. I think that's the cool thing you mentioned is the fresh matchups because it's kind of one of those things where, you know, you mentioned the Osprey uh, Orange Cassidy match where, you know, some people were not a fans of, you know, that pairing. And look at everybody here is talking about it being like match of the night. You know, I put out a poll and you have uh, my timeline was filled with Osprey Orange right. Cassidy, Osprey Orange Cassidy. And so that kind of tells you, you know, just because you don't think it might be the thing to go, uh, you know, there's an, there's, a, you know, you're offered a platter here with different selections and you just never right. know what's going 
going to be the thing that hits. So I think that was like the really awesome part of Forbidden Door. So now I just have two more questions for you. Um, and Rocky, so I want to kind of shift gears because even just doing this interview with you, you are a busy guy. You are a busy guy. <laughs> you know, you're uh, not only do you have, you know, your office row with New Japan Pro Wrestling, uh, you have New Japan Strong. You, you know, made appearances on Impact, on AEW. Uh, you're kind of all over the place. How do you do it? I don't know. I really don't know how. <laughs> I just kind of go with the motions now. It's just kind of like, honestly, it never ends. It's, 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 it's been, I've been really at it. Like the last couple of months have been tough. So uh, like I said earlier in the interview, like just having a couple of days to just kind of like chill and like, I'm still working. It never stops, you know, but like, these are, these are the more chill days than I've had in, in, in quite a while. But, um, but yeah, I, I mean, for me, Coming out of the pandemic, the most important thing and for me was, you know, kind of being the ambassador for New Japan Pro Wrestling worldwide with all these different companies, whether it be Impact, whether it be um, AEW, MLW. I mean, we've kind of worked with every GCW, you know, kind of worked with everybody and trying to get talent kind of everywhere. Uh, I, I That was kind of always my goal because I like when, you know, promotions work together as opposed to against each other, you know, like, I feel like there's, there's, uh, there's a lot of business to be done. And, uh, and, you know, smart business, you know, being smart about it. And, uh, you know, obviously, like, getting our wrestlers in front of different crowds, I think is important, because I think that's how you kind of grassroots, you know, the, uh, the exposure of New Japan Pro Wrestling. So that's still important to me. Um, So yeah, coming out of the pandemic, you know, I just wanted to, you know, get New Japan hot, you know, and, and really, you know, get them in front of new fa- a new fan base, a different fan base. And, um, you know, so I feel like I've been really successful so far with that, you know. And, um, yeah, I just, I don't know, I love that company. I love that company. It's the best company I've ever worked for. And uh, I think the wrestlers are so talented. And New Japan Strong is kind of like now, you know, it wasn't supposed to be a thing. And, you know, the pandemic came. And it was like, well, what can we do? You know, we got to, let's provide content for New Japan World and let's shoot it. Okay, well, what can we do? We can shoot it in the studio and we can test everybody and try to make a safe environment for everyone and, and you know, continue to bring wrestling uh, to, to our fans. And uh, we did it. And, you know, we started to focus on, you know, some of the younger guys like Clark Connors, who, you know, got a great opportunity uh, at Forbidden Door who, and he kicked ass, you know. Um, you know, so he, you know, he's been one of the important parts of, of the new Japan strong show and kind of seeing his growth. He goes over to the super junior does really, well, really well over there has a great match with Tomohiro Ishii, you know, uh, in the eliminator for, uh, the all Atlantic title and, you know, Ishii goes out and Clark goes in. So it, it kind of all worked out, you know, in some kind of way, like that's where I talk about, you know, having deep rosters, you know, even at that, that's like something that like people were like, well, who's Clark Connors? And this kid's not going to do well. He's obviously in there just to eat a pin. Da 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 da. And at you know, at the end of the match, everybody's screaming, "Let's go, Clark!" Fifteen thousand people are saying, "Let's go, Clark! Let's go, Clark!" And uh, and now you know, people know who he is, which is really cool. So um, so yeah, thank you for New Japan Strong for having that as well and having that roster to to kind of help uh, build up New Japan, you know, kind of uh, post pandemic, you know. So uh, yeah. Uh, New Japan Strong I, if you haven't checked it out I hope you guys do check it out because they're really really good shows uh, you can watch a New Japan World Fight TV and if you if we come to a city near you we, you know we're every other month in Los Angeles Denise has been there she can be a testament to this that you know the shows are awesome Exactly, exactly. Okay, my last question to you is a two part question. Uh, with the COVID restrictions, essentially, you know, kind of lightening up a little bit, you know, the world's opening up little by little, right? Uh, do you think we're going to be seeing you uh, more so in Japan? Or are you going to stay here? Um, what's, <laughs> what's that going to look like for you? And like, just overall, like your general goals, you know, for this year? Um, you know, I don't know. I, I kind of like the mystery of not really knowing. I mean, obviously, I'd like to go to Japan. I missed the super junior. I really wanted to do that this year, but we just had so much going on. So, um, yeah, I don't know where I'll show up next, to be honest. Um, like I said, I'm going to take a, a couple days, maybe a couple weeks off. And then, you know, we do have some new Japan strong stuff coming up. We have a, a pay-per-view in Nashville that just is going to be a part of Starcast and, uh, the Ric Flair weekend. So that's going to be huge. That's July 30th 
And um, we just signed some really big names to that, some really, really, really big names. So uh, maybe you'll see some IWGP tag champions there, maybe, possibly. Oh, I like that. I that. like you, that. Oh, you like the scoop. So that's right. I forgot. <laughs> yeah, I was uh, like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but we got a we got a great card uh, that's kind of panning out, and we just signed. A, uh, like I said, we just signed some big names to it. So look out for that. That'll be live on pay per view Fight TV. Um, and then uh, yeah, New Japan Strong in Charlotte, July twenty fourth. Right before that, and tickets are on sale now. You can pick up tickets. We're bringing a uh, Hiromu's coming. And I hear maybe another couple of great Japanese wrestlers are coming as well. So you don't want to miss that if you're in the Charlotte area. Um, and then, yeah, later in the year, another big pay-per-view show is coming to the East Coast around October. So the deal has not been signed yet, but it should be signed soon. So that's another big scoop, uh, big pay-per-view sized event coming to the East Coast. Um, that is so yeah. awesome. Yeah, so you're getting all the scoops, Denise. Yeah, I'm you're just taking favorite. them all right now. <laughs> <laughs> you're way better than that Sean Ross app, that's for sure. Anyway. Dang right. <laughs> Dang right. I'm going to clip this out and I'm going to post it. <laughs> yeah, repeat. Put it on repeat. Um, Except a yeah. loop. <laughs> yeah, on loop. And then, of course, you never know when I might show up at AEW, hopefully with Trent and OC and Chuck Taylor uh, as well. Uh, Impact, of course, we've got a great relationship with them. Uh, every Thursday night, New Japan Pro Wrestling on Access TV following Impact. So don't miss that if you want to watch more New Japan Pro Wrestling. Awesome. Rocky, I want to thank you so much for taking your time to come and chat with me here today. I'm going to post all of the links in the description box below where people can get all the information for all the shows and everything that you just talked about right now. So Rocky, thank you so much. Until next time, I'm Denise Salcedo. This is Rocky Romero, and we'll see you guys next time.